What's up? This is Answer Everywhere. We're going to take a look at how uh, the handoff between how Emacs handles the the handoff between the C code and the Lisp code. And uh, initially, I was thinking of running things through a debugger. That's a little bit challenging, partially because I'm not a uh, <laughs> I'm not a GB expert, and I haven't built Emacs from source. But we're going to look at the code, and um, the TLDR is that, at least my understanding is, and we'll we'll verify this, that the the basic idea is that Emacs is in a sense mostly written in C. It implements a Lisp. The Lisp largely does things like call C functions, but then once you've sort of bootstrapped the Lisp, um, the the new Lisp functions can be defined in terms of the the like primitive Lisp functions. And so it's going to look a lot like uh, any other language that's implemented through some implementing language. Um, I didn't go back and watch the original Emacs video, so I don't really know how much of the um, how much of the entry point we've looked at. But I don't really remember. I just I just did a quick look at. It. I don't really remember it much. But I think Emacs.c is the um, is the main entry point. We have a bunch of conditional uh, stuff here, like whether we're on Windows, whether we have pdumper, whether we're on Android. But somewhere there's a main. Yeah. You know what I could try to do is, let's clone this. And see if we have un if def, which I think is a thing. Get rid of this blender stuff. And yeah, let me install this. And I have no idea how to run it. So let's see if there's a... What have I done? It's freezing. So unidentifiable. Unidentifiable will remove preprocessor conditionals from code. Okay, so it acts on if, def, blah, blah, blah. What's the syntax? Specify that a macro is defined to a given value. Specify that something is undefined, etc. Okay. So how can we use this? I don't know. We'll go into it's still downloading. It's a little bit surprising, but I guess it's an old an old project, so it has a lot of history. So what do we want to unif def? Certainly Windows NT. I don't know what pdumper is. It's something about portable dumper. Hello, KFC. Is that named after the the chicken franchise? Or is it just a, uh, a coincidence? Okay, so let's look in, probably what is it, source, emacs.c, go to source, and we'll just grab for if def. If def lower, lowercase. And then we'll call unif def, we still have the man page. Uh, big U for a symbol will un, um, unset it.
We'll just unset all the things. Let's see. Let's see what that looks like. Uh, whoops, that was not the uh, that was the output of the I guess the no that was that was right okay cool. Except now I don't have a main function. Oh, this is asking me about um, whether I want to ignore the local variables, which I do. Are these now the same? I swear that I had a main function. Okay, int and main are just on different lines. And there's a space after main. That threw me off. Okay, so... Uh, we don't want... Um, we don't want Android. Let's do this again. have Android. And what else can we get rid of? We'll get rid of sec comp. That's looking better. We'll get rid of have p dumper. There might be a faster way to, to get rid of all the stuff. In fact, let's just double check the See if this is enough to have a readable file. Okay. So here's um here's the main function. And ex except it's rid of domain. Daemon must exit. Must exec, I guess. Okay, so here's what happens when you call main. I, I believe this is the, the main entry point of Emacs as a whole. We're going to, we have, this, we have some comments, which is good. Variable near the bottom of the stack and aligned appropriately for pointers. So you have some stack bottom variable, which is at the bottom. I guess maybe the stack grows up, probably. And we have an old arg C. I don't know what we're doing with the old arg C. And we're going to check whether we should apply a sec comp filter. This should, so I think I told it that I don't have set comp, so this should probably have been inside the if def, but uh, perhaps it's not. Uh, we'll call, we'll set no load up to false. I don't know what that does. We'll set the, a junk pointer to 
to the literal zero. And we have dename arg and change to directory both set to zero. And what? We're going to record approximately where the stack begins, which is stack bottom, which is we're going to take the stack bottom variable and cast it to a car star. We've got this dump mode stuff. I don't know what dump mode is, is doing. We also have this um, tmax string, which is set to null. And while skip args is less than args, arg c minus one, I don't know where skip args was set, but it probably doesn't matter so much. But this is like some args parsing. And we're going to look for things like temax. I don't know what temax is. Let's see if we can find temax with the T. The special option temax tells temax how to record all the standard preloaded list functions and variables. Okay, so whoop, 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 whoop. Let me bring this offline just for a second. The command, uh, no, no, no. The compilation of the C, the C source files in the source directory produces an executable file called tmax, also called bear impure emax. That's where you can record all of your most impure thoughts. It contains the emax lisp interpreter and IO routines, but not the editing commands. So I'm guessing the editing commands are, um, they're probably not written in lisp. They're probably written in C, but they are probably a, um, a significant part of the initial bootstrapping into lisp. They have, they probably have Lisp um, versions. They're callable from, from Lisp primitive functions. The command tmax l load up would run tmax and direct it to load up.el. The load up directory adds additional Lisp libraries, which set up the normal emax editing environment. After this step, the emax executive executable is no longer bare. But is it no longer impure? I don't know. Because it takes some time to load up the standard list files, the tmax executable usually isn't run directly by users. Instead, one of the last steps of building emax runs the command tmax batch l load up tmax dump method. The special option dash dash tmax tells tmax how to record all the standard preloaded list functions and variables so that when you subsequently run emax, it will start much faster. The dash dash tmax option requires an argument dump method, which can be one of the following. We can use pdump, which uh, records the preloaded Lisp data into a dump file. This produces an additional data file, which emax will load at startup. It's usually called emax.pdmp. We also have pbootstrap, which is used while bootstrapping Linux. Is there emax? We have dump, which calls it to, to dump an executable program called Emacs, which has all the standard list functions already preloaded into it. And bootstrap, like dump, but used when bootstrapping Emacs with the unexec method. So that's, that's useful context. Let's go back and we can see some of that here. Although, what was I going to look up? Um, load up, load up.el. Let's just do a search for load up.el in the wild. So here's loadup.el. This is the thing that um, loads up the Lisp files, right? The Lisp um, libraries. And it is only 734 lines. And we get some comment. This is probably similar to, the, to what we saw before. This is loaded into a very max to make a dumpable one. Emacs injects the variable dump mode to tell us how to dump. If you add a file to be loaded here, keep the following in mind. Some, this is some stuff with uh, or, or like Emacs contributors or whatever. So we've got some dump mode. We're going to figure out how to do it. We've got different methods. We, and we have some lists of subdirectories like Emacs, Emacs Lisp, prog modes, language international, text mode, VC, which I guess is for like venture capital funding. Yeah, actually, it's probably for version control. And we're going to load a bunch of stuff using the load function like backquote, byte runs, subber, 
key map version widget custom. And I'm really just looking through these to kind of get a sense for what core Emacs functionality is written in Lisp. Window? I don't know. This is probably not the window implementation. I think the windowing implementation is written in C, but this is presumably some Lisp, Lisp functions for dealing with windows. We're going to load files. Cus face. I guess custom faces, also faces. This may be standard faces. It may just be the libraries for dealing with faces. Faces being like fonts in Emacs. A brev help EPA hook. Some language stuff like support for, I'm assuming, mainly characters, Chinese, Czech, European, Japanese. Menu bar, tab bar. Prog mode. Is this org mode in here? No? I don't know what, I'm just, you know. Just seeing, just seeing what's here. Okay, so this is loading a bunch of stuff, and it's got some code to dump, dump things out. So let's return to the C code. So we're going to look here if we have the TMAX stuff. And uh, if it is, we're going to break. And I guess this is mainly like populating the, the TMAX variable. And that's skip args. We, we, at, at some point, we're going to populate dump mode. I don't think we do that here because we haven't used dump mode in here. But if we're done here, then if we're not initialized and we have tmax, we'll look for this argument first before any heap allocation so we can set heap flags properly if we're going to unexec. And um, if we're not, if we don't have a dump mode, then we see that we have an invalid tmax mode. And if we have tmax and we're down here, then I guess we are initialized. Then we say tmax not supported for unexec emax. I don't know what unexec means in this context yet, but we'll find out. Otherwise, we're going to assert that we don't have the tmax and we're not initialized. So emax unexec. So Emacs now uses a portable dumper instead of unexec. So I think I told it not to use the portable dumper. Maybe that was a mistake. Uh, but this improves compatibility with memory allocation on modern systems and is, in, in particular, better supports the address space layout randomization feature. OK, so let's tell Emacs that we do have a portable dumper. And how do we do that? Do we just say it's true? We'll define it to the value one. Let me write the buffer. Okay. So that changes things pretty considerably. Where does main go? Or maybe not. Um, now we're doing a bunch of string comparisons. We're checking to see if tmax is at the pdump or a pbootstrap. And if so, we've got this g flags things, and we'll say that we will dump with pdumper if either of these is true. Otherwise, we might be bootstrap or, or pbootstrap, in which case we'll say that we will bootstrap is true, and so on. And otherwise, there are things that are not supported, so we error out. If we have NS, I don't know what NS is, but we'll ignore it. Um, but we'll attempt to load pdump. If attempt to load pdump, I guess if we're trying to load pdump, then we call load pdump, passing in the arguments in the dump file. And that will be the initial Emacs executable. I forget exactly what pdump did. I think that um, pdump is the one that produces an executable. Is that right? No, it makes a dump file. So the dump method causes it to make an executable called Emacs. I feel like that's probably the default, is it not? I don't know. At any rate, we call load pdump and we get an initial Emacs executable, and we maybe disable address randomization, depending maybe on the arguments. 
we'll ignore time re remapping. But if we're down here, we're going to initialize the standard FDs, I guess file descriptor, file descriptors, and we'll call at exit close output streams. I'm guessing at exit is a bit like um, a bit like defer in Golang. This is something that's going to run uh, when we exit. And I don't think I have tags, so let's oops, don't do that. I don't think I have tags, so let's do the tags file. Uh, let's see if we can find at exit. The at exit function registers a function to be called at normal process termination. Okay, so this is not like defer in Golang. It is something that runs when the process terminates, not something that runs when we get to the end of the function. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to close the output streams just so we clean up after ourselves. And then we have some command line argument parsing. And I'm going to skip as much of this as I possibly can. Some stuff about versions, fingerprints. We get a current directory name, which we set to the Emacs working directory. It, we may be doing some PDUM stuff. We're looking for things like change directory. And I'm going to assume down here we're close to the end of parsing. And I'm going to ignore have setter limit. See if we can do this officially. This looks like a pretty big block. All right, now we got to scroll down to wherever we were. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so at exit, we run this, that thing, and then here is what? Command line argument pressing. Good, okay. Um, or we call clear error, uh, I guess, to clear any sort of errors. And then we, we call emacs backtrace negative one. Is this some error condition? I'm not sure. And we might do some stuff about malloking. Here's some MS DOS stuff that we're going to ignore. We're going to set the locale. We have some text quoting flag, which we get by calling it using UTF-8. It's presumably going to do one thing if we're using UTF-8 and another thing if we're not. We're not going to inhibit the window system. And then we're going to handle the dash T switch, which specifies the file name to use as terminal. So you might set a specific terminal. We're going to ignore this. Um, the command line option no windows is deprecated and thus not mentioned in the manual and usage information. Which is strange because I use it all the time. <laughs> all the time I had no idea it was deprecated. All right, so uh, we don't do that. Um, that tells Emacs to like open in the terminal instead of um, opening a window. We might be in batch mode, which means that there's no interactive display. Instead, it's going to like run Lisp, uh, Emacs Lisp, it's kind of like a script with no, like a headless way. In fact, it takes a switch argument, so we'll ignore that. Then we set daemon type to zero, and make sure is daemon startup as false. So whatever setting daemon pipe of one uh, to zero, we'll set the socket file descriptor to negative one. And I don't I don't know what only version is, but. We're going to now do a command line parsing to see if we're being asked to, to be a daemon. And if we are, then we might be a foreground daemon or a background daemon. And if daemon type is bigger than zero, so we're either foreground or a background, we do some stuff. If we're two, then we start as a background daemon, fork a new child process, which will run the rest of the initialization code, then exit. Detaching a daemon requires the following steps. Fork, set SID, exit the parent, close the TTY file descriptors.
we only want to do the last two steps once the daemon is ready to serve requests, i.e. after loading.emacs. Okay, so this is just setting up daemon stuff. And then if daemon, I guess, is one, that's not there, but it's somewhere, we're gonna uh, we're gonna do some stuff. Here's, we're still looking at, at whether to set up a daemon and forking and whatnot. If we're done here, then I think we're done figuring out our daemon situation. We're gonna initialize signals. So now, let me just double check something here. Now we're going to initialize signals um, to set whether we are non-interactive. And if we're not initialized, perform basic initial initialization, not merely interning symbols. So we're going to init out the allocator, I guess, uh, initialize the p-dumper. Ob array is maybe an object array. Initialize eval once. Maybe these are things that are run exactly once per like Emacs instance. Initialize carousel, uh, coding, syntax, category. We don't know what category is, but case tab, buffer, and mini buff. And then we get some comments for some of these. What does category say? Create the standard category table, which I'm not sure what that is. Some Emacsy thing, I assume. And then some like faces stuff, some keyboards, I guess symbols of key faces, symbols of keyboards. Symbols of data, file IO, alloc, print once. Maybe call F fun call and so GC, thus the latter should be initialized. Not sure what that is. Uh, more character set stuff, coding, etc. If we have a window system, then we're, gonna, we're going to init fringe once. It says swap bitmaps if necessary. I don't know what the fringe is and what swapping bitmaps. Uh, which bitmaps are we swatching, swapping? When is it necessary? I don't know. And then, um, once we're at the end of this block, we are initialized. So all of this one stuff is now being replaced by init alloc, init big num. So we're no longer like init alloc once. This is like the one time stuff, and this is maybe um, stuff that's initialized every time you start Emacs or every time you start the client. I'm not sure. Uh, initialize some uh, per instance or whatever allocator stuff, some big number stuff, threads, evaluation. We'll say that we're not running async code. Async abbreviated slightly unusual, unusually with the H instead of uh, usually you end at the C, but this is Emacs. They do what they want. And it random and it X faces. And if we're not initialized, which I was hoping we would be by this time, then we call sims of comp, comp, I'm not sure, and some stuff about garbage collection. Do less garbage collection in batch mode. No load up is going to be set to the, you know, if you ask to, to call no load up, no site lisp is going to be set to whether you ask to do no site lisp, et cetera. I don't know why this um, not initialized block is not done here. Perhaps this stuff needs to happen first for some reason. And then we might have modules, which I will ignore. I'll ignore have ns. And if we have the X window system, then we'll get we'll uh, create a string for the display name. I still don't know what only version does, but we're trying to figure, okay, so you might ask it to, to go on a specific display and so on and so forth. Um, this is still argument parsing. This is like, if you have no site list, et cetera, we have more uh, stuff that happens if we're not initialized, like sims of call proc, set initial environment, set a timer. And then if we're down here, maybe we're almost ready to do work. We're gonna set and we're gonna initialize buffer storage in default directory of main buffer. So this is to hold the main buffer. And then we've got init call proc one, must proceed init command args and init sys modules and init, init command args. And if we are initialized, then we erase any pre-dump messages in the message log to avoid confusion. So I guess um, as we were starting up, we might have there might have been errors or whatever that populate the message log, but we have since uh, uh, um, loading stuff up is slow, and so we're using this dump procedure to kind of preload things. And so anything that's pre 
dump we're getting rid of because it would be confusing, I guess, to the user. And that's what that block is. And we're going to init the call proc, init file IO, init L read. I don't know what L is, maybe line. If version was specified, produce version information and exit. I guess only version is you're just asking Emacs what version number you're running and it's going to print stuff and exit like the version command of any other utilities. And then if we're done here, we're going to enter the names of all standard functions and variables define standard keys. So this is string interning. We've seen it a few times before. And that's what these, I guess, symbol uh, sims, I'm going to guess is symbols. And we're going to intern all of this stuff. And we might have modules. We might have some stuff for Windows and all of that, all that stuff. We might be in the Haiku operating system. Init X term. In a, oh, whoa, whoa. So maybe if we're down here, we're done interning. If we have X windows, we're going to call init X term, which is going to initialize some stuff for X term. And then we're going to call init process Emacs. Sock FD. This looks like it might be the money function. This can create a thread that may call get env. So it must follow all calls to put env and set env. Also, this sets up add keyboard wait descriptor, which init display uses. So we init process Emacs, we initialize the keyboard. This too must proceed in its modes. We initialize the display. And if we're non-interactive, we init crit. And we might init x disp, which I guess is here we were initializing x term. This I guess is maybe for the display. And if we have a window system, we're going to init the fringe. Maybe the fringe is like the decorations. And we may also have we and then we also initialize macros, window, and font. And if we are not initialized, we do what? This is more stuff about load up. Um, like this must be where it like uh, loads in load up that el. This is some stuff about native compiler. We'll ignore it. Profiling will ignore. If we're done here, we set initialize to true. If we have a dump mode, then presumably we're going to dump. Uh, and then what is this? Allow code to be run mostly useful after redumping. Okay. And then here we enter the editor command loop. This never returns. So this is the uh, one of these is the um, infinite loop that runs Emacs. And I'm going to assume it's f recursive edit, but we're also going to call set initial mini buffer mode on void and whatever e assume false is e assume so i guess this is just like a like an assertion we get down here it's a failure we should never have edited never have exited what should we never have exited presumably f recursive edit so let's see if we can find f recursive edit So maybe this is now a, a lisp. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a ctags file. There's a ctags file committed to the uh, to the git repo. Ctags good. F recursive edit. Okay. So I'm guessing that the F means something. Let's try recursive edit without an F. Well, we have this. X turn lisp object, lisp underscore object recursive edit one. That looks promising, although we don't have recursive edit one, we have recursive edit. We also have mini buff C, and this is has this call one Q mini buffer quit recursive edit, all one thing with, with underscores. We have F exit recursive F edit, and so on. Okay, so let's ask the AIs. So what is F recursive edit in Emacs source code? I'll say in Emacs.c.
It says it's defined in this, which I don't think it is. Let's go here. Let's just try a recursive edit with no F, which I think I did on, on, on GitHub. I think that must be somehow calling this function. Or it's, um, what else could it be doing? There could be some pre-processing that like creates the function. But let's look at lisp.h. Maybe that's the place to be. All right, so lisp.h. Define a type constant ID as an externally visible name. Use like this, define GDB symbol type ID, blah, blah, blah. This hack is for the benefit of compilers that do not make macro definitions or renews. So this is some GDB stuff. We've got some max and min defined as macros. Uh-huh, uh uh-huh. We have emacs int is an int, emacs uint is an unsigned int. We've got some whatever. Use PD to format PT to pointer diff T values. Extra internal type checking. Define Emacs versions of assert.h's assert, cond, and verify, etc. Okay, we have lisp bits. So there's something about tagging, which I think is about maybe tracking lisp stuff. And what? Some operations are so commonly executed that they are implemented as macros, not functions. Because otherwise, runtime performance would suffer too much when compiling with GCC without optimization. There's no need to inline everything, just the operations that would otherwise cause a serious performance problem. For each operation op, define a macro lisp h op that contains the operation's implementation. That way, op, or rather op, could be implemented via a macro definition like this. Define op x, lisp h op of x, etc. So these are different operations like cons p, xlp, xli, and what is going on here? When you call xli on o, then we, I guess, cast as an int o.i if lisp words are pointers. So I guess lisp words might be pointers. What else might they be? I'm not sure. Some other thing that's not a pointer. And we have like lisp check lisp h check symbol, which we'll call check type on symbol of x, comma q symbol p of x. I'm not sure what that means, but something about checking symbols. And we have a bunch of forward declarations, including one of them is the recursive edit thing, right? So here's some here's a struct for Lisp symbols. It's a union of some stuff. Union of what? Well, one is a uh, struct. I'm not sure where this ends, but um, this struct has a a some boolean for I guess garbage collection marking bit. Maybe whether it needs to be reclaimed. Some symbol redirect that indicates where the value can be found. So I guess it might be a pointer, or this might just it might be conceptually a pointer where it's a a name, and then redirect has like some some table lookup or something. Uh, something about trapped writes. So whether the symbol I assume is interned, although this is I guess some enum. Declared special. This means that the variable has been explicitly declared special with def var, et cetera, and shouldn't be lexically bound. Uh, and some other stuff. So like the object's name. And then we also have the value of the symbol or, or q unbound if unbound, which alternative of the union is used depends on the redirect field above. Okay, so 
it could the the value could be a Lisp object, a Lisp symbol, a Lisp buffer local value, or a Lisp forward. And then we have a function, function value of the symbol or q nil if f bound, if not f bound p, and a property list, and the next symbol in the ob array bucket. So ob array, I guess, is object array. It's like a an array, like a linked list of Lisp symbols. Okay. So this is this is starting to be the Lisp imp implementation, obviously. I am not sure what pvec is. A pseudo vector. Okay, that's not so. And we're defining some Lisp objects. I don't know if there are any of these that I recognize. Something about bare symbols. Make Lisp symbol internal. Okay, and so where was recursive? Edit. This is extern Lisp object recursive edit one dot void. We also have read menu command and sims of keyboard. Let's see if we can find. Um, well, I feel like if we were to find recursive edit, we would have seen it. Um, we would have seen the Lisp the Lisp version too. You can look in Minibuff. I don't know if Minibuff has what we were looking what we're looking for. The Minibuff.c is a C file. We have a, a list. What is this function? Okay, so this is a C file, but it's defining Lisp. Uh, Lisp functions with this defund macro, I guess. So, for example, abort mini buffers. We have this f abort mini buffers and s abort mini buffers. So, this is interesting. This is telling us that there's some f and s prefix thing. Something about zero, zero and the empty string being default arguments or, or something along those lines. So, defund takes some parameters maybe that we're not using. Then we have a doc string abort the current mini buffer. If we are not currently in the innermost buffer, prompt the user to confirm the aborting of the current mini buffer and all contained ones. And it's the uh, void might be the return type. We've got this mini buffer depth, which is an Emacs int. And we're going to find it by calling it on q nil. We don't know where q nil comes from. And we're going to create a Lisp object array of size two, or rather, yeah. And an auto string, which I am guessing is really just a string. I guess we're going to set format to the string abort mini buffer levels question mark with a uh, a thing to be populated in stream string interpolation style. And if we're not in the mini buffer, we error out. And if nil p f mini buffer innermost command loop p q nil, then we are not in the most nested command loop. So here again, we see the f prefix thing. This I think is probably calling something like a Lisp function. So that seems to be what what f is about. But maybe we can find out more. Um, and then we check mini buffer depth, etc. We might call one q mini buffer quit recursive edit, and I don't know where that that is is defined. Here it is. Okay, so dash. We have dashes instead of underscores. We're going to depth symbol mini buffer dash quit dash recursive edit. I guess we're defining it to be this. And I don't know if we have an implementation. Or maybe the maybe the implementation is in Lisp. Oops. What if we just look for a recursive dash edit? Have we done that? This looks promising. We have macros.el help. Oh. 
Let me see if it's in macros.io. So we have this recursive edit thing. Let's just copy this. Or rather. Let's try this one more time. So this is some function. It says with prefix argument flag, enter recursive edit, reading keyboard commands, etc. It's asking for the Emacs source to. Here we go. This is in keyboard.c. It looks like recursive edit. Why wasn't it finding this? Or maybe it was. So we have this F recursive edit and S recursive edit. I don't know what those means, but they'll be uh, the answers in the defund macro, macro. And this function invokes the editor command loop recursively. So this is where it hands off the C we saw in the main function where we call F recursive edit. And it must really be calling this function. Um, and it's going to invoke the editor command loop recursively. To get out of the recursive edit, a command can throw to exit. For instance, throw uh, exit nil. The following values, blah, 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 this is about throwing. Okay, and it's void. It's called when uh, this is called by the editor initialization to begin editing. So we check if um, input is blocked. If so, we return Q nil. I don't know what Q means, but this is essentially like returning nil. Um, if we're, the command loop is bigger than or equal to zero, and current buffer is not the X buffer of X window selected window contents, then we'll set buffer to F current buffer. Otherwise, we'll set buffer to Q nil. Hey, Ant. Hey, Justin. Vos Gates. How's it going? And then uh, we'll increase the command loop level update mode lines to 17. I don't know that 17 is for record, unwind, protect. And this is all in C code, right? Um, and if command loop is bigger than zero, if we leave recursive edit one below with a throw, for instance, like it is done in the splash screen display, we have to make sure we restore a single keyboard. So we're going to temporarily switch to single keyboard. And then we'll call recursive edit one. And we're going to return unbind to count and Q nil. I don't know what unbind to is, but this is, uh, I guess, recursive edit one is like maybe going one level deeper. And now recursive edit one is a Lisp object. Presumably a function. All, and we define it with underscores. And I'm going to guess that after we define it, it becomes a thing with dashes instead of underscores. I don't know what spec PDL index is, um, but we create a Lisp object val. And if the command loop level is bigger than zero, then we're going to call spec bind. Spec, I'm not sure what spec is meaning, but this is some sort of binding standard output, standard input. I don't know what QT is. I guess true, maybe? Symbols with, with uh, position enabled is set to nil. Print symbols bare is set to nil. If we have window systems, we're going to call cancel hourglass. So I guess we were waiting. The command loop has started, an hourglass timer. So we have to cancel it here. Otherwise, it will fire because the recursive edit could take some time. Do not check for display hourglass p here because it would, could already be nil. OK, so we cancel the hourglass timer so it doesn't look like we're waiting. And we call spec bind. This function may be called from a debugger. So this is something about debugging, inhibiting redisplay. Uh, this thing is some variable stores buffers that have changed so that an undo boundary can be added. Spec bind this so it changes in the recursive edit, blah, blah, blah. Let's see if we can find anything about spec bind. I misspelled it. Spec bind like that. Spec PDL. What is spec PDL? Something about stacks. The spec PDL stack keeps track of backtraces, unwind, etc., and uh, dynamic let bindings. Is that the same as? So 
So spec bind might just be dynamic binding. I'm not sure. And then we said val to the command loop. And if val is equal to, I guess, qt, maybe the same is true, then we quit. If whatever string p is, we could do some sort of string test on val and I guess send a signal. And if val is a function, then we're going to call it. Call zero, I guess, meaning we're calling a function with no additional argument. And we're going to call unbind2. Let's look at unbind2. Unbind2, pop and execute entries from the unwind protect stack until the depth count is reached. Return values. So unbind2, you give it a, um, a this spec PDL, we've decided is some sort of stack. And we give it a count to, I guess, to pop to or a level to pop to and, and some value. And quit F is, I guess, we're checking if something is, if we're quitting. Um, we're setting the VQ, the V quit flag to Q nil, I guess. This is maybe so that we can reset to, to what VQ V quit was when we were called. And while the spec DPL, spec PDL pointer is not the thing we get from calling ref2 pointer on the count, then we copy the binding and decrement spec DPL, spec PDL pointer before we do the work to unbind it. We decrement first so that an error in unbinding won't try to unbind the same entry again. Okay, so we try to unbind, and um, I don't know where count came from here. Count was the index at the start of the function. So we may be doing binding, and then uh, we basically undo everything we did in this function. Let's look at what spec bind is. I'm going to guess this, pop, this pushes something onto the stack. Spec bind. Spec the spec PDL pointer describes which variable is let bound. So it can be properly undone when we unbind to. It can either be a spec PDL let or a spec PDL let local slash default. Symbol is a variable being bound. Note that it should not be aliased. Where tells us in which buffer the binding took place. This is used for spec PDL let local bindings. Okay, so this is uh, basically looks like bookkeeping for um, for let bindings in Lisp, and Emacs has this strange Emacs Lisp has a strange behavior with respect to variables, and that might be related to how that's implemented. Um, so what else do we want to know? We saw where it calls this recursive edit thing. Um, I would be curious to see the definition of defun. I think we probably saw it before. It's probably define defun is promising, but not in test. Yeah, Lisp that age. There we go. Okay, so define a built in function for calling from Lisp. L name should be the name given to the function in Lisp as a null terminated C string. F name should be the name of the function in C by convention. It starts with F. Okay, so F is the C version of the Lisp function, which makes sense. It does not say, but it seems to be true that Lisp names have dashes and C names have underscores. S name should be the name for the C constant structure that records information on this function for internal use. Okay. I have no idea why, why this particular naming convention, but S is, I guess S is struct, F is func, I guess for C, L is L for lisp. Is that what, is that what's happening? By convention, it should be the same as F name, but with an S instead of an F. It is too bad that C macros can't compute this from F name. Okay. And then we have things like max args, min args, int spec. What is int spec? Uh, int spec says how many, how, how interactive arguments are to be fetched. Okay. And so we saw like, um, some D funds that had zero, zero, some stuff, maybe nil for int spec, et cetera. And so that's what that is. So I think I might leave things there. Um, we saw, 
we haven't seen the windowing system and stuff. I, I think that's okay. I was asked to just really look into how the, the handoff from C to Lisp went. Um, we haven't gone deep into the Lisp system. We looked a little bit about it before. Um, and we haven't really looked at like how it's going to handle windowing, although we have looked at X windows and some other windowing libraries. Uh, the Emacs, I'm sure, since it's so ancient and beautifully ancient, is going to have uh, code that is has to be backward compatible with like if you pull off your some machine from the 1980s that runs a version of Unix you've never heard of. I'm not sure if the current version of, of Emacs will run on it, but um, it's it's got that, that sort of scope of backwards compatibility. So I'm not sure um, where it, it, it might be difficult to kind of go through all of the windowing stuff. And I, and I don't think that's really what my, what my, uh, my mandate here was, but we see where the handoff is and we can kind of now we're in a place where like, if we want to understand this more, or we want to understand the setup more, um, we can dive into those things, knowing more about the, the boundary point. But thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Justin is saying I am your new Patreon sub. I really appreciate that. Thanks. And uh, thank you, uh, Prene, say, or is saying that they found my channel today and it's incredibly helpful. I'm so glad to hear that, that folks are finding it helpful. I am uh, I'm just uh, heading out for today. I have a couple of things, just that, like bookkeeping stuff I want to mention. One is, if, like just, if you want to be as cool as Justin, you can join my Patreon. I'm going to give the Patreon an overhaul perhaps in the next few weeks, depending on what else I have on my, on my docket. Um, and if you want to support me, you can also support, support me through YouTube. I don't really know how, how the membership works, but I'll also um, tidy that up as well. Um, this is the last, as I mentioned at the beginning of the tips on code reading video, since I recorded all three of these in one go. Uh, this is the last of the old series of requests. There were a lot of them, and um, we're, we're finally through the backlog. There will be a new regime for, for how we handle requests, as I mentioned uh, in, in that video. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still be doing code reading videos. Um, a, a smaller percentage of them will be from the request list. So I need some way of managing um, how those requests get chosen. They will be determined. Um, by the community. Uh, since there will be not as many of them, uh, I want to make sure that they are ones that, that lots of people want to see. So I'll talk about how that's going to work. Probably next week is when I'll go through some of that. Um, for the rest of this week, um, I recorded a bunch of videos, so you have to chop them up, do some light editing. My, my videos are tend to be pretty raw. Uh, but I do go through and edit them for uh, just to make sure nothing <laughs> uh, any any like uh, if if something breaks or whatever I like to cut those out. Um, so that'll take a, a while to, to get them all up, and I don't want to just dump like I don't know what it is like nine videos all at once um, because that will kind of overload the channel. So those will be coming out. Um, possibly some by the end of the week, but possibly kind of starting next week. Um, and I'm going to, in addition, be doing more uh, videos uh, writing code. And I haven't quite decided how I want to do that. Um, I think that I may make some of the code writing vo videos uh, members only so that there are some, uh, so that, uh, Mainly so that the, I'm not flooding again the channel with with videos that most people are not so interested in, and then there will be periodic code writing videos that are kind of like more like updates that are that are public for everyone. And if you want to follow the nitty gritty, instead of being spammed, uh, you can you can become a member or whatever. Uh, so that's where I'm leaning for that, and then and then. Uh, I don't think I've said, but I'll also be doing code reading videos that are 
uh, instead of being requests, are kind of driven by the needs of some of the stuff we're building. And so those will be videos where we do things like revisit some of the more complicated repositories multiple times and, and go deeper in depth. Um, they may also just be videos where I think it would be fun to look at this sort of project we haven't looked at before. And I think that there's something that we can all learn from it. So that'll be guided more by the, um, the, the direction of, of, of me, the direction of the channel and less, uh, less like, uh, uh, taking requests from the, uh, from the crowd. All right. So that's all for me. I hope everyone has a good rest of the week and thanks for watching.